Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 76. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzama, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Good day to you, Dr. Woolman. And a lovely day to you, Christina. How are you? I should say aloha, because aloha. I see that aloha shirt on. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a special reason for the aloha shirt, which we'll get into in a little while. Fabulous. But I try to dress appropriately for each uh, topic that we have, and so this is just a little hint of uh, where we may be going today, oh. at least for part of our journey. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide along with Christina today as we search another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy looking for optimal health. Always a good thing to look for. And we have one of our favorite people with us again today, Christina, as you know. We always look forward to having Tracy Harrison on with us. Uh, those of you that have been watching our show know that Tracy is um, a health counselor with a special interest in nutrition and healing and helping people to eat with purpose. So uh, we're going to go over uh, some very interesting things today. And I would recommend that everyone after this show go back, if you haven't seen the other shows with Tracy, that you go back and check them out. I find myself continuously checking them out and find things <laughs> in each one of them that I missed the first time. And it's a great resource, all of her shows. So Christina, if, if anybody wants to get in touch with us today to uh, ask Tracy a specific question, mm -hmm. how would they do that? Well, at any time during this live presentation, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment just by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. And make sure you click submit so it will show up on my screen and I can share it with our wonderful um, guests and Dr. Woolman. Or if you prefer to dial in, our conference line is 323-476-3997. The ID is 607 393 pound. And not to worry if that went by a little fast for you, it will actually show up on the screen during this whole show. Thank you, Dr. Woolman. I always, when you're saying that, I'm always picturing these uh, pledge drives where some fa <laughs> famous person comes on and says, operators are waiting. <laughs> well, they are waiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. So, uh, I would like to welcome you again to our show, Tracy, Magical Medical Tour. How are you? I am great, Glenn. Thanks very much. Hello, that's Tracy. <laughs> I love the idea of being on a telethon for health. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. Right. We should do that. <laughs> would that be cool? I mean, I, I think that would be really cool. I think it'd be great. Call in with your questions. Right. <laughs> and if you call in and donate more than $10, you will get a uh, a free recipe from Tracy Harrison and, and another recipe for $50 from... Uh, Christina. Oh, no, it should be the other way around. <laughs> well, I, was, I was going to add, there are more prizes for Tracy. Tracy will come and cook a meal for you. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, that's the grand I've prize. I've done that before, actually, for fundraisers uh, in terms of doing an in-home cooking demonstration. It's a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. Ooh. Okay. Glenn, I'm, I'm impressed that you're dressed for the topic today. <laughs> yes. I, uh, I try to do that with all the shows. I, I have some kind of a clue that I... Uh, like to uh, give to people in my dress. I never really tell them that. Last last uh, week, we had uh, Dr. Gary Winston on, and we were talking about water in the planet. So I was wearing a deep blue water shirt. And uh, today, I'm wearing an island shirt, and we're going to get into that. It'll be obvious at some point. But Tracy, you know, I wanted to start out before we actually get into today's topic, although they're all topical. <laughs> uh, and possibly tropical. Yeah. The I always introduce you as saying that part of your essence is you teach people to eat with purpose. Correct? Absolutely. But I don't think I ever said to you or asked you, what is the purpose? <laughs> what the heck does that mean? <laughs> what is what is eating with purpose? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think that most of us, unfortunately, don't eat on purpose. We eat based on what's on sale, what's convenient, what we've been told to eat, 
what maybe our our parents or our family ate growing up. Um, and and we eat without, I think, uh, an acknowledgement every day that we are literally providing fuel for this incredible vessel of our body. I mean, food is the one thing that we actually put in that be physically becomes us, right? The the skin cells, the, the stomach cells and whatnot that we're going to be growing next month are based on the raw material, the building blocks of what we're eating today. So do people eat with the purpose of feeling great or do people eat with the purpose of nah, whatever? Hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of the latter. Um, versus eating toward a certain goal. If you want to feel fantastic, then we should put fuel in our body that's going to make us feel fantastic. Uh, If you want your car to run really, really, really well, you don't put soda in it because it's Mm. probably not going to go and nobody's Mm. surprised, right? Right. Um, I don't know why we should be so shocked when we put suboptimal fuel in our bodies and then we don't feel very well. Should we... Should we be thinking when we're buying food, eating food, making choices at a restaurant, should we be thinking about proteins, carbohydrates, and fats and supplements? Or should we be thinking like I was the other day when I was eating Ethiopian food? Uh, I really think that um, the body will tell us on a visceral level uh, what we really need. I, I think cravings, as long as they're not for stimulants, you know, and in a drug-like mode, uh, cravings are really important. They're not uh, nasty, annoying things to be suppressed, but generally cravings tell us what we need to know. And so I think there's a nice match of trying to see what sounds good, right? Because Uh, animals in the wild do not know anything about proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, right? Your dog doesn't know anything about that, but uh, they will eat in the wild um, what is suited to their bodies. So I think intuition is a very important part of the equation, Hmm. but using the intelligence of the frontal lobes from amongst what is available to select what you think is going to set you up best uh, for your goals. You know, if one of your goals is to lose a lot of weight, eating on purpose does not involve eating a lot of pasta. But maybe if you're going to run a marathon to get tomorrow, maybe loading up on pasta is actually eating on purpose. Um, So it's not so much about there being a magic answer as much as really acknowledging what you're trying to achieve and purposefully moving toward it. So, So, Tracy, you had said just now about cravings and when our bodies will tell us what we're needing. But when people have cravings for like sweets and things like that, is it, uh, is it, uh, would that be considered a a healthy, purposeful eating? (laughs) Well, my, my caveat is, um, except for when people are craving stimulants. Mm. And so I put caffeine and sugar and things that get rapidly turned into sugar in the body mm. in those categories. Um, because I think the the neurological need to self-medicate with food um, can really drive us to seek more and more and more stimulants. I think that comes from an honest place in the body and often is as a result of people, for example, not having enough sleep. Mm. Uh, It is a very primal response in the body when we're dealing with too much stress and not enough sleep for the body to seek readily available energy. And so that's when people tend to crave sugar, for example. But um, the root cause of that is about what you're asking your body to do. So if you want to live a sleep-deprived, stress-fueled life, then yeah, your body (laughs) thinks sugar is the best thing ever. Right. But there are consequences of that. And, And so thinking about, is that is that purposeful? Is that going to get me the end goal that I want? Or do I want to change the initial trigger? Mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how often people will find that if they will simply allow themselves to sleep enough and really very directly address major sources of stress in their life, they really don't crave sweets nearly as much. Um, I also find that um, very often people crave sweets 
literally when they're not getting enough <coughs> sweetness in their life mm. on other fronts. Um, if we're denying ourselves the um, love and affection and companionship um, and uh, friendship that we might need from a community perspective, I do think it makes perfect sense that that shows up as a craving for sweets. Mm. Um Again, is the is indulging in those or binging on those going to ultimately get you the goal you want? Is that purposeful? Or do we want to change the root cause triggers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another great example of that with food is when people may crave and binge on ice cream at night. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I find this is very often the case when people have not consumed sufficient fat during the day. Uh, especially a lot of people who are still caught up in the fat is bad for you myth. They've been good all day and denied themselves sufficient fat during breakfast, lunch, and maybe even dinner. But the body's still craving fat. It mm. needs fat. And so it craves fat in the evening time. And having that fat come in with a big dose of sugar that would be numbing to mm -hmm. stress sounds pretty good to the body. I'm going to get my fat and I'm going to relax at the same time. Well, from your body's perspective, that's a pretty good deal. But there are consequences of that. And do you want to change up the equation? Have more fat earlier in the day very often shuts down the craving for things like ice cream at night. Mm, interesting. Wow. A lot so of it has to do with neurotransmitters in the body, yeah. in the brain. And you talked about neurological. Uh, a lot of times if we have a need for serotonin, or a need for norepinephrine, or or some of the other neurotransmitters. A lot of uh, a lot of papers are written on moods and foods and uh, the neurotransmitters and why people eat in certain ways. And why does a person that's a more anxious person eat more of these foods? Why does a person that's more depressed eat these foods? Mm. Uh, so there's a whole there's a whole science working on this right now. Speaking of cravings, I'm having a craving to uh, find to, to start today. Uh, we we what do decided you mean we haven't started yet. <laughs> We're just warming up. I have up to tell here. people you have to listen to the pre-show because that's a show in itself. You have to listen to the show itself, then you have to listen to the after show because that's a whole other show in itself. <laughs> I think with Tracy shows we should break them down. I think this was just our our appetizer, our yeah, petty force. Uh, Tracy Harrison is infectious. That's all I can say. <laughs> She's one Thank of the best you. infections that we can have. <laughs> That's great. So today, Christina, uh, Tracy and I decided that we talk a lot about a lot of serious things and food and diet and digestion and everything else, and a lot of very important facts, uh, lots of numbers and describing what types of foods are proteins or carbohydrates, or a lot of science. But today we decided to have a little more fun. So we're going to look at a number of categories. Not that we haven't had fun. I know. I was like, oh. All the way. Yeah. Yeah. No more fun. Uh, today, today will be a lot of fun. So we're going to be asking Tracy about uh, five, five types of foods in multiple categories. And just to give you an idea, the we, of course, want to try and stay within the magical medical tour process. So we're going to start and ask Tracy, what are her five healthiest foods that she suggests to people. <laughs> good luck, and, Tracy. And as I was having, indeed, as I was having a good time explaining in the pre-show, uh, when I was formulating my uh, list for this show, I had a hard time. Uh, I'd like to be sharing with you the 35 healthiest foods that you might want to try. Um, but but I, did, uh, I did try and choose some um, suggestions for things that might surprise people or um, might give you some foods you want to try and explore adding to your own diet to add some interest and variety in in a nutritious way. And uh, Glenn, do you want me to cover um, the full list or um, one nope. at a time with a little explanation? What would you like? Uh, let's do the uh, one at a time. So okay. we're going to go with the five healthiest foods first. All right. So um, the, the first item that I have on my list is broccoli sprouts. Mm, yummy. Um, we talked in prior shows about the, the incredible power of the cruciferous family of vegetables to help with liver detoxification. 
This is something that's well been demonstrated through clinical study and vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, turnips, uh, radishes are mm -hmm. all part of the cruciferous family, uh, which are high in sulfur which is very useful and required for the body to bind and excrete the vast majority of toxins that we pick up in day-to-day -day life in the modern world. Uh, and it's been shown that the sulfur-containing molecules that are in these vegetables are highest in broccoli in terms of the actual foods themselves and are even much higher in the sprouts from broccoli. Hmm. And if you go to your produce section in your grocery store, you will indeed be surprised to find that you can buy broccoli sprouts and radish sprouts uh, and all sorts of other little spindly green sprouts that look just like what you got from your seed in a styrofoam cup in kindergarten. Uh, <laughs> and they're delicious. They're really delicious on a salad. They do have a broccoli flavor. And you can add them to a salad or mince them and sprinkle them on a stir fry. It's not a strong flavor, but they are exceedingly high in these uh, detoxifying sulfur compounds mm. and, and pretty easy to find in a grocery store. Wow. So, so, the, so those little sprouts are more powerful than the big chunk of broccoli that is so green and luscious? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Now, what obviously the big stalk brings is a whole bunch of other things that the plant has to grow over time. So, for example, absorbing more minerals. The sprouts aren't going to have anywhere near the quantity of minerals that the whole plant does because mm -hmm. obviously it hasn't been growing in the mineral-rich soil for as long. But for this particular benefit, I think um, we really struggle to get enough of these detox-supportive nutrients in our diet. We struggle to eat enough cruciferous vegetables. They, they tend to be a bit bitter in flavor, which is why a lot of people don't like them. But the sprouts are not bitter. And so it's a, it's a really easy way to add some of that detox power mm. to your diet. Wow. And I, you actually I, I, that, depressed that me list. for a moment. You, you do realize, <clears throat> Glenn, that she did give a little list in there too, right? I know. Because I want to ask about the, me also. the turnips. I and all. You, how, did, how did I depress you? Well, I was thinking back to when I was in kindergarten, and I didn't think we had styrofoam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, touche. Uh, you know, the Dixie cup. You had Dixie cups. Yeah, I Dixie know you cups. had Dixie cups. Definitely. That's uh, not going to help, Tracy. I think okay, we need to sorry. go. Well, let me move on quickly. <laughs> let me move on quickly. Um, the second one that I think is one of the healthiest foods, and again, something that a lot of folks perhaps have not tried, is hemp seed. Mm. Um, most folks are familiar with the concept of hemp, but not necessarily eating it. And uh, we're, there's a lot of popularity in the nutrition and uh, food media about the benefits of flax seeds and chia seeds, but hemp seeds are really, really wonderfully uh, nutritious. And um, I recommend them to a lot of my clients because they have some of the good um, mineral density and, and um, real um, high proportion of healthy fats that the other seeds do. But they also have quite a bit of protein. On uh, Just a, uh, a level tablespoon of hemp seed has five to six grams of protein. So it's a, a great thing to sprinkle on salads or atop soups or vegetarian entrees in order to get a, a wider array of, um, of proteins, of amino acids. Uh, but you can also put it in a, uh, a fruit smoothie, for example, in order to boost the protein content a bit. Um, you can um, buy them usually just in a little package or in the bins of a, a health food store or a co-op. And uh, they have a nice, mild, nutty flavor as well. So some of the similar fiber and mineral uh, benefits and healthy fat benefits of other seeds, but appreciably higher in protein. Yay! That's I, what I, I use for my uh, smoothies. Hemp oh, protein. good for you. Great. You know, I'm, awesome. I'm impressed already. When I was thinking the healthiest foods, I never would have picked broccoli, sprouts, and hemp already. So... You're already going way beyond what I expected. Oh, that's great. Well, I have to, I, I'm so happy because we've been, I <laughs> added hemp seeds to our morning breakfast oh, every for morning for mm -hmm. over a year now. And Wonderful. my son's yogurt on top of our cereals. 
Woo-hoo! Good for you. Fantastic. Yay! To see. So, <laughs> back to what we talked about. People are looking for easy ways to, to spice up their diets with nutrient-dense foods. Even if people are eating things like uh, steel-cut oats for breakfast and mm-hmm. putting a sprinkle of a little ground flax seed, a little hemp seed, um, that's a really powerful way to change up the nutrition of something with a pretty simple step. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love I love the hemp. It's it's just added to the granolas. It's oh yay! I'm doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you're doing a lot of things right. Uh, the next thing on my list is organic free range eggs. Yay! <laughs> I am, and this is something that you probably expect, um, but I have to say, for me, this is a back to basics item that I think is just really hard to beat in the food world, especially when we're looking for convenient, inexpensive options. Um, eggs are very easy to cook quickly, and in terms of uh, a balanced mix of protein and fat, they're one of the richest sources of vitamin A that we have. Of zinc, vitamin B6, B12, especially with people who are trying to eat vegetarian or um, mostly vegetarian diets. They really are a blessing in terms of the B vitamins and the um, the mineral zinc. Uh, and obviously uh, a very potent source of protein. Uh, two eggs is 15 grams of protein, which is plenty for a serving uh, for a meal. Uh, they just take a few minutes to prepare uh, and actually, I want to I want to bust a myth that I, we talked a little bit about before. But for this show in particular, eggs are not killing people from cardiovascular disease. It's just not <laughs> happening. That's a giant myth that sells a lot of breakfast cereal. Uh, but it's uh. it's just not happening. It is not played out at all in clinical research. In fact, one of the most prevalent ingredients in eggs is in the yolk, and it's called um, lecithin. Um, which helps the body to emulsify cholesterol mm. and to better manage fats in the body. Um, so there, there's a lot of myths we have around eggs. If you enjoy eggs, we should be eating eggs. Mm. But you'll notice I said organic free-range eggs because uh, there's a lot of toxic crap that can be fed to chickens uh, mm. in, in commercial um, production. And organic food will help to make sure that the chickens have not been fed huge amounts of genetically modified food or a lot of other stuff that I don't really want to gross people out. So I'm not going to talk about it, but suffice it to say. <laughs> you might want legal. to talk about it because it might change the concept of what well, is or- organic free range egg. <laughs> well, okay, so I'll make one comment, and then I'll move on. It is standard practice in um, conventional egg production that the non laying chicks, meaning the male chicks, will very often get ground up and added to the food. Um, <sighs> with organic eggs, that's not legal. <clears throat> Mm. Um, so that makes my skin crawl. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so I, I think people just don't know these kinds of things, yes. but when you're getting organic eggs, you remove the likelihood of that in food, in the food source for the chickens. But also when chickens have been allowed to truly free range, um, not just cage free, but free range or what is sometimes called called pastured. They are able to eat bugs and grass and dirt, um, and they pick up a huge complement of minerals and nutrients that they don't if they're raised inside barns and just fed corn. And obviously, this is what chickens have been eating for millennia. Mm. Um, so you, if you compare side by side, most people are shocked to realize the difference in the integrity of the shell and the rich, bright orange color mm-hmm. of the yolk of a free-range uh, egg rather than the more anemic yellow um, of a conventional egg. Mm. Um, so that's number three on my list. Ooh, Going yum. just before you go to number four, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, in one of our last shows, we had a uh, uh, one of our viewers wrote in talking about uh, taking out the yolk and eating only the egg whites, and yeah. there was a big push on that for a long time. And I know your thoughts on that. How about mentioning something of that for our viewers? Um, it's a great comment. I'm glad you brought that up again, Glenn. It's true that the majority of the protein in an egg is in the uh, white, but all of the nutrients, all the minerals, all the vitamins are in the yolk. 
So I'm a big fan of eating whole eggs. If people don't like that because of the richness or the flavor and they want to use multiple egg whites, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I would encourage folks to consume at least one yolk because that's where all those vitamins and minerals I just described are located. What about the shell? I don't recommend eating the shell. <laughs> how, about, how about in a smoothie? Um, it's, it's definitely a source of minerals. And I think to your point, as long as the, um, the digestive system tolerates it, it is a a form of, uh, of roughage as well. Uh, It's a good, good example. Another good example is, um, the shells of peanuts, as long as they're organic for most people, if they're cooked are also quite digestible. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, it, it's okay, Glenn. I, I think if you tolerate it well, it's fine. It would be a little advanced for a lot of people's digestive systems in terms of the um, intensity um, of the minerals. But there's certainly mm. nothing toxic about it, indeed, especially if the eggs are organic. Mm. Number four. <laughs> Number four is... <laughs> this is fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Number four, I have to say, would be seaweed. Yay! Um, <laughs> Christina, you're batting a thousand. Uh-huh. Now, now I wanna I wanna caution people. I am not talking about that gelatinous, gooky-looking stuff that washes up on the rack line at the ocean, <laughs> because for the most part, those are not edible seaweeds. The the big dark brown and gray with the big bulbous little um, globules on it. Um, there are hundreds of, of uh, digestible types of seaweed, though ingestible types that are incredible nutrient dense. There really is no more mineral dense food on the planet than seaweed. Uh, It's also our most potent source of iodine. And iodine is really critical not only for the function of the thyroid, um, the vast majority of people who have a goiter or a swollen um, thyroid have uh, um, insufficient iodine, but actually every cell in the body needs iodine. And what surprises a lot of people is that um, hormone sensitive tissue in particular needs iodine. It's actually something mm. that helps to regulate hormone receptors on cells. So, for example, women who have breast fibroids or uterine fibroids or men who have um, problems with swollen uh, prostate, Mm -hmm. Uh, iodine can help with this because it actually will downregulate the hormones that are being put into those cells that are causing that trophic (laughs) behavior, that growth, um, and calm it. Um, and, and seaweed is by far the best way to get iodine in the diet. It can be done by including some seaweed in salads. Uh, if you've ever dined at a Japanese restaurant, you could have eaten seaweed salad, which is really quite delicious and involves a lot of different kinds. But you can also buy really convenient ways of supplementing with seaweed and little products called um, seaweed sprinkles mm-hmm. or little um, square little kelp snacks which are little squares of um, nori seaweed that are really quite delicious. They're brushed with sesame oil, and you can eat them intact as a snack, almost like a chip, or you can uh, shred them and sprinkle them on a salad. But um, seaweed really has to be at the top of my list. Uh, It also makes use of farmland, if you will, that's not being taken up because it's obviously grown in the sea. Mm. Um, But uh, I, I think it's really, really wonderful um, food product to that. A lot of people are surprised, um, at how good it tastes, but that's a different list. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, that, but I will see, we definitely has to be on the, on the healthiest food list. Oh, yay. I think I would add though, that those little seaweed wafers, the little squares, mm-hmm. they're semi addicting. Yeah, but it's okay. Semi, my goodness. <laughs> okay. There, there's a, there's a positive addiction for you. <laughs> but I, I also have to say though, um, to to inform everyone to really read those packages that they come in because um, a lot of them come, uh, depending on which part of Asia they come from, there might be a lot of MSG on it. Ah, okay. Great as catch. well. And uh, some of the oils that they're using um, is, uh, I think some of the, the brands are extremely oily. And ah, they okay. use like, um, like just a regular vegetable oil or instead of the grapeseed oil, instead of the sesame oil. They have a mixture of other oils, so that's something to be aware of as well. Because believe me, I've read so many of those packages. It's one of my favorite foods. 
<laughs> Excellent. Well, and that's a great that's a great um, caution, Christina. I agree. There really shouldn't be anything on it other than perhaps some salt. And um, typically, like you said, I, I love it with sesame oil because it gives it a nice flavor, which takes mm. the vegetal edge off of the seaweed mm. for, for beginners mm-hmm. to the yes. seaweed arena. Uh, so I recommend um, really simple onesie twosie kind of ingredients. That's a great catch. Yeah. Uh, but Number I love five. it. And, you know, it's very interesting because the, um, in Asia, the, the women tend to eat a lot of seaweed, and we use it in all our soups and everything. I mean, the Korean, the Japanese, the Chinese, and after childbirth, even more so, because that's mm-hmm. when the hormones are out of balance, and they were finding that a lot of Asian women were coming down with goiter. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I know my sister suffered from that after her second child, and she had to go through a lot of surgery, and the atomic cocktail. <laughs> yeah. So it was a pretty nasty, but even though we consumed a lot of seaweed even then. So, but we love it. I love Good it. Good for you. Number That's four. Great. Okay. What's number five? <laughs> <laughs> number five for me would have to be wild salmon. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, as I said, I wanted there to be 32 things, but, um, I, I really think wild salmon is, is fantastic um, because it is a, a fabulous source, obviously a protein. It is the most um, omega-3 rich fish that we have outside of things that people don't tend to like to eat, like sardines and mackerel. Oh, I love those too. Um, <laughs> but, but, but salmon is it's much milder in flavor. Um, I, I definitely put the wild a caveat on it because, uh, similar to the chickens, farm raised fish are fed a lot of things that would shock you like the waste from chicken house floors. That is another common oh, practice gosh. for farm raised fish. I'm not making this up. You couldn't make this up. Um, it's considered to be an efficient use of, um, that waste product from the, the floor chicken houses. So that mm. is routinely fed to farm-raised fish, um, as well as a whole bunch of other types of uh, hormone and toxin growth promoters that, of course, are contained in the flesh of the fish. And when you were eating the whole fish, we're getting whatever the fish ate, that's mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but salmon is also uh, not only very high in omega-3s, and I think palatable to most people, but it also is particularly high in a really fantastic antioxidant called astaxanthin. Hmm. And uh, it's actually the ingredient that makes the flesh of salmon that pinky orange uh, color. Uh, it's also what makes um, krill have that orangey color. It's what makes flamingos have that uh, orangey color. Hmm. Um, so uh, I really do think salmon is just such a wonderful choice in the in the smoked form. It's a, it's actually a palatable, high protein choice for breakfast as well. So that makes it um, a, a broad based option. Um, but it, it definitely has to be on my list because of the very high content of, um, of astaxanthin and of omega-3s in a, a nice full-spectrum protein source that is loaded with the typical minerals, B vitamins um, that you would find in all fish. Mm. Okay, five out of five. You Good might work, as well go Tracy. to <laughs> You did well, Christina. Awesome. Oh, but I also love the sardines and all too. So Well, and for, for the viewers that are watching, I'm always very interested in in people's own individual diets, what they might want to type in. You know, mm-hmm. what would you have on your top five list? I think that's a great thing to share. Oh, yes. Oh. Ready to move fun. to another uh, category, Christina? What do you mean? This wasn't the category. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was the first category of healthiest foods. We're now going to go and ask Tracy, and this will be the obvious clue, what five foods would you choose to have on an island if you could only have uh, foods that would help you survive, of course? It depends on which island. Are we in Fiji? <laughs> Are we in Tahiti? Are we in Hawaii? Are we in Samoa? <laughs> So it also depends if you have your Vitamix with you and your toaster oven and your. Uh, <laughs> Are we on Salt Spring no. Island? <laughs> Which there's a lot of lamb. <laughs> That's very funny. So, so I assumed we're on a deserted island. Desert island. <laughs> Well, hopefully there are coconuts out there. (laughs) A deserted island. So so I did not, for example, include fish on my list because 
I am making the assumption that one could acquire fish of some kind. And so uh, generally speaking on an island, protein is not a concern um, because obviously there would be all sorts of different types of seafood available, including fish. Um, But I do think if we were limited otherwise, um, there are some real specific things that I would choose to have. Uh, And some of these um, might be available on the island. For example, the first thing I would bring with me is a lifetime supply of avocado. Um, I think an avocado is really a very magical food because it is an extremely rich source of both fat and fiber. And that's unusual. We don't have a lot of foods that really boast very large amounts of both of those. Um, avocados are have reasonable you know, shelf stability. They don't have to be refrigerated. They don't have to be cooked. So I think it would be a great choice from that perspective. Um, but also, if for some reason we were caught without being able to... Um, to fish for a period of time. Um, Avocados actually have iron in them. They have uh, vitamin B6. Um, It's very unusual for a a plant food to have really high levels of vitamin B6. Um, Good source of uh, magnesium. Um, But in particular, really high levels of good, healthy, monounsaturated fat and very high amounts of of fiber. Uh, In fact, a... um, a, a half of a typical, you know, medium-sized avocado has about eight grams of fiber, uh, which wow. beats out all the nuts, all the seeds, all the whole grains. There's only a couple of legumes that would compete with that. And legumes aren't really useful on an island because you have to soak them and cook them for a long time. Mm. Well, I just so, want to let you know, Tracy, you got the first one correct. Okay, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then so, this is what you would bring to an island. Sure. Correct. So if I okay. could if I could bring in five foods, right, okay. then right. I, I would just be able to survive on. Um, the the second thing that might be on the island but might not would be coconuts. Um, and, and this is also a tidbit for anyone who finds themselves in a movie like Tom Hanks, um, marooned on an island, what would you possibly eat? You would immediately start gathering all the coconuts that you can possibly find. Because I think most people are shocked to find out just how nutritious coconut is. Um, when you pop a hole in it, you can drink the water um, from the inside. Coconut water is a ragingly potent source of potassium. Um, and also clean hydration. Uh, if you were on an island and couldn't find anything other than salt water, which of course you can't drink um, too much of. Um, but again, coconut is also a very, very high source of fiber, a very high source of healthy fat, and surprisingly is also a very good source of protein. So mm. when in doubt, if you had to try and survive on just one food, I would recommend the coconut. Just I for would, two, Tracy. I would eat the meat and I would drink the water. And you, there are definitely people who, in, in all honesty, have been caught on islands or been marooned or um, had shipwrecks who have survived for very long periods of time just on coconuts. Mm. So hopefully that's already on the island. But if it wasn't, I would actually bring it because of the convenience. Again, you don't have to cook it. Um, with enough diligence, you can open it and uh, you could definitely survive on it. Great. Mm, love that. Now, let's get into things that we would definitely not find on the island. Um, I would bring kale. Of, of all the vegetable choices that I could choose, uh, I would bring kale because you can eat it raw. You can eat it cooked. Um, it is extremely nutrient-dense. It's a member of the cruciferous vegetable family. It's really quite high in iron which we would want to make sure we could get, especially if for whatever reason we couldn't fish or we found that we weren't a very good fisher man, fisher woman. Um, But I would bring kale um, because of, again, the the density of fiber and the density of phytonutrients. That dark, rich green color is just loaded with uh, with phytonutrients. Um, There are over 700 identifiable phytonutrients in kale, which is one of the highest. Um, the next thing that I would choose would actually be quinoa. Now this is cookable. This is something we'd have to cook. Um, but quinoa, we think of it as a grain. It's actually a seed. And again, if I, if I couldn't fish, quinoa is a complete protein. It is one of only two whole grains. that's actually a complete protein. 
and it's delicious and cooks very quickly. We would not need to to uh, heat water very long to pour in some quinoa and um, somehow cover uh, a pot um, or a coconut shell with a palm leaf and uh, and cook the quinoa. Um, it would also be a, a really good source of carbohydrates um, in that kind of environment. So kale and quinoa, uh, two really nutrient-dense foods I would choose to have just in the sense of rounding out the diet. And then the last one, not a surprise, but I think if I'm going to have to be a marooned on a deserted island, I got to have dark chocolate. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. That was on your list too, huh, Glenn? That was on my list too. Um, yeah. Simply because I think we would not want to go crazy uh, <laughs> on a deserted island. And dark chocolate has all sorts of really uh, wonderful natural chemicals that are very calming to the body. Uh, it's mm. one of the reasons why people find that just a square or two of dark chocolate is not only delicious and good for you, but it tends to mellow us out. Um, that is courtesy of a few different polyphenols in chocolate. Um, the most, um, I think, potent of which is something called uh, theobromine that uh, is really mellowing uh, mm. in the body. So, um, I, but I have to have that as a treat uh, to keep me from going crazy or having a fit of depression while on the island. Perfect. Wow. And if there were some natives, I could probably barter my dark chocolate for something else of use. <laughs> no, That's no. Is this uh, sugared dark chocolate or not sugared? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, we haven't really talked too much about chocolate. Um, completely unsweetened chocolate is unpalatable. Uh, it's extremely bitter. And so a little bit of uh, sweetener of some kind is really necessary to make um, chocolate delicious. My favorite is very dark. Uh, my favorite brand is actually um, Endangered Species makes a really lovely 85% dark chocolate, which mm. a lot of people find too bitter, but I find mm -hmm. it incredibly rich and only one or two squares really does the trick for me. Um, but, um, but I think in this case, we definitely would want to have it be a little bit flavor, a little bit sweetened because we wouldn't have a way to get sweetener on the Island. That True. sounds good to me. <clears throat> now I know what to All give right. my son when I need him to come down here. <laughs> yes, you get a send piece him to of an dark island. chocolate. Well, he just loves dark chocolate, but at least I know it mellows them out instead. <laughs> yeah. It's not your imagination. It's, um, it definitely works. But, uh, but Glenn, right. with, your, with your lovely uh, tropical shirt on, I'm interested in what was on your list because I know you have one. You must have one. <laughs> well, I had, you know, I wasn't, it was a deserted island for me. So I had mangoes. Ah, okay. I, mm. Great sweet mangoes. I ended with chocolate, but I also, I had the avocado uh, and then I had mushrooms, uh, some of the healthier mushrooms mm -hmm. um, to add some things. And, uh, I thought about, I had a problem with figuring out, again, the th list of 32, coconut versus avocado. And I figured there'd be cooknuts, so I went with avocado. Excellent. Great. Fantastic. But that's one, okay, wait a minute. There's mangoes, avocados, mushrooms, chocolate. What else? Uh, I would also consider uh, almonds. Almonds? Ah, mm. yep. Okay. Again, and, and a great, obviously a great food in the sense of not needing to be cooked, um, but something that, that's quite shelf stable, that's a nice balanced source of protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. Plus, when I was making my dessert, I would have chocolate, mango, and almonds, which was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd have a whole load of sashimi. <laughs> Indeed. That's great. All right. Excellent. Let's go. Let's move on. Uh, this, this is going to be interesting also, I think. Your five most surprisingly delicious foods that we wouldn't think are delicious. Hmm. <laughs> this, uh, this, this is a fun one for me because one of the benefits that I get from my personal practice is working with a lot of people who are trying very hard to expand their diet and to eat more nutrient-dense foods. But obviously, none of us are going to eat things long-term that we don't like the way they taste, right? I mean, you want to you wanna consume food on a daily basis that you love. And I, I always uh, remember when 
people share with me in our sessions that they tried something and they couldn't believe how good it was and they just couldn't stop eating it. And so I'm I'm happy to share some of those. Um, the first one, and I have to say the most common one that uh, is shared with me, is roasted Brussels sprouts. Mm. Oh, that's so now, good. Brussels sprouts are a type of cruciferous vegetable. And as I mentioned earlier, many times people don't enjoy them because they tend to taste quite bitter, courtesy of the sulfur, the density of sulfur that they include, which is good for the body, but is bitter in flavor. And unfortunately, a lot of us growing up consumed these cruciferous vegetables prepared in a way that gave <laughs> off a lot of sulfurous smells in the kitchen, especially boiling. Mm. Those of you who have boiled cabbage for St. Patrick's Day, for example, know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, it, it gives off a strong sulfur smell, a bit like rotten eggs. But um, when you prepare foods in a way that doesn't involve water, that doesn't um, therefore pull the minerals from the food, you don't get the same kind of aroma. So roasting cruciferous vegetables is a great way to avoid the obnoxious smell. And it's also a way to bring out the sugars in vegetables. And believe it or not, most of my clients who try roasted Brussels sprouts share with me that they kind of taste like candy. Now, by candy, I don't mean Skittles. What I mean is that it brings out the sweetness in the vegetable that totally overcomes and um, masks any bitterness. Mm. And it's very easy to rinse Brussels sprouts and cut them into quarters and toss them with a little bit of olive oil or coconut oil and slow roast them on a cookie sheet in a single layer. And you want to go until they have a nice, just very light kind of golden brown color. Mm. Very tender and very sweet. <laughs> Christina's mm -hmm. bouncing. I'm bouncing because I love Brussels sprouts. I've always loved Brussels sprouts. And the way, you know, Chinese, I mean, what can I tell you? they got to make it taste good somehow. So it was always stir-fried with uh, garlic. So it was stir-fried with the garlic and a chicken stock. Mm. So it was, oh, it's so good. <laughs> good for you. That's great. And some people really do naturally love the flavor, but um, I find even the vast majority of children will eat them if they're roasted. Uh, and if it's if it's tough to, to think about a whole pan of Brussels sprouts, you could easily mix it with some chopped onion or carrot or sweet potato, all of which become extremely sweet when roasted and make more of a medley. Mm -hmm. Really nice side dish and a nice, um, with the carrots and the sweet potato, a nice starch, oh starch alternative to the typical rice or pasta or potatoes mm -hmm. that we, we eat. And it's not that those are bad for us, but we eat too much of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had a comment that just came in that said, I love Brussels sprouts with pine nuts, dried cranberries, and balsamic. Ooh, Ooh delicious. That sounds so good. <laughs> Very nice. That's great. Good for you. That's wonderful. Number um, two. Number two is another cruciferous vegetable. I'm determined to get them in. Um, <laughs> this is um, what I call patali flour, hmm. mashed patali flour. And um, it basically is providing an extremely healthy, low-calorie, uh, low-carbohydrate alternative to mashed potatoes, and that is cauliflower. And you can um, clean and rinse a cauliflower, cut the, the tough leaves and the tough core in the center off, and then separate the florets and steam the cauliflower in a, in a large pot uh, with just a, maybe a half an inch of water in the bottom and steam it really thoroughly until it's incredibly tender. And then you can um, heat up in a saucepan some olive oil. Use quite a bit. Don't be stingy. Um, maybe a, a quarter cup of olive oil and a few cloves of garlic. And I want you to just mm. saute the garlic until it gives off that delicious aroma. And then when you're done, you're going to put the cauliflower and the olive oil with the garlic in either a strong mixer like a Vitamix or a food processor. Add salt and pepper to taste and puree it. Mm. It is exquisite. Mm. Uh, it has a very similar texture to mashed potatoes. Um, again, my experience mm. is that children will love this if you don't tell them what it is. Um, you don't you don't set down something that looks like mashed potatoes and say, "Look, darling, cauliflower, gobble it." Um, <laughs> it but it's a really wonderful way again mm. to increase the nutrient density in your diet, 
change out the same old heavy, dense carbohydrate starches um, and get in the benefit of those cruciferous vegetables. Again, people don't believe me. This is one of the foods that I most often recommend as a recipe for my um, my semi-annual cleanses that I run, where we're really encouraging people to eat lots of cruciferous vegetables for a couple of weeks. Um, but again, I, I tend to get a lot of emails. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how delicious this is. I ate the whole pot. And the good news is a whole pot of cauliflower, it's got about 75 calories. Uh, a whole pot of mashed potatoes has about 700. Very mm. different starch density. Um, so that would be number two on my list. Wow, Chris, sounds yummy. Tracy, we believe you. <laughs> <laughs> we believe everything you say. <laughs> okay, Thank you, Glenn. Okay, um, number three... Um, let's see, I would have to include tempeh. Mm -hmm. uh, tempeh is a, a fermented soy-based food. Now, the phrase fermented soy is enough to make most people's toes curl. Um, and when I better describe that it's a, a flat cake-like um, substance with fermented soybeans and whole grains kind of mashed into a patty, this does not encourage a lot of people to eat it. Most people kind of roll their eyes and say, yeah, I'll pass. But the average person is really shocked to find out how delicious pan-browned tempeh is. So tempeh is typically sold in a little block. It's an extremely inexpensive source of vegetarian protein that even meat lovers tend to love. And it's nice to shake up your diet a little bit and change out the animal protein for a plant-based protein. And uh, fermented soy removes a lot of the concerns about soy, in particular the goitrogens or the ingredients in soy that can block the thyroid hormone action. Mm. Um, but it's sold in a little cake and raw, it's not something that a lot of people would palate. But if you slice it into little um, individual little um, links that look a, a little bit like a fish stick and simply heat some oil. I love it with coconut oil. If you heat some coconut oil in a pan on medium-high heat and just lightly brown the tempeh on both sides, most people are shocked at how nutty and hearty it tastes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really delicious, chopped into cubes and put on top of a salad. You can stir it in with a vegetable stir fry at the last bit just to coat it with the sauce, whatever um, spices you're using. Really delicious, highly inexpensive, has great shelf life. You can stock up on it. It's good in your fridge for about six weeks. Um, but, but again, a, a way to consume soy that has tremendous flavor. A lot of people are critical of tofu because they understandably say it tastes like nothing, it's gelatinous, it has a strange texture, but tempeh is really a totally different animal, and it's a great way to get much greater nutrient variety than you would get by choosing soy alone. I made that as a meatloaf once. Ah, good for you. That's delicious. Yeah. Okay, number four. Number four, um, I would choose whole leaf green tea. Mm. An awful lot of people try green tea, and because they never had it before, they don't know what to look for. They go to the store, they buy the cheapest uh, brand they can find or the kind of national store brand, and they come back and they tell me it tastes like a bitter paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that because I have to agree. I'm a bit of a green tea snob, admittedly, and I agree that an awful lot of low-end green tea, when you steep it, tastes like a bag, a paper bag. It tastes mm -hmm. like the tea bag. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it's low quality green tea that has um, it usually is not fresh. Uh, it's been in the package way too long. It's been pulverized and includes a lot of the stems of the green tea. So it's, again, the low end harvest of the green tea. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in a paper bag. And so when you steep the paper bag, if the bag <laughs> has been treated, you get the chemicals from the bag or even if it's an unbleached bag. It's still going to taste like a bag. Um, mm -hmm. But what I find is when people will step up to a, a bit of a higher brand of green tea and look for whole leaf green tea. Um, two of my favorite brands are Numi and Mighty Leaf. These are both organic brands. Delicious, really delicious. And then the secret to green tea and not having it be bitter is twofold. One is do not boil the water. 
You really want water that's more at about 170, um, 180 degrees, not boiling. And you only want to steep a green tea bag for typically about two minutes, depending on the size of your mug. If you steep it too long, it will get bitter. But again, I find that when folks try what I've suggested, they're shocked at how flavorful higher quality green tea can be without that strong, bitter paper bag flavor. Excellent. Mm, yummy. Number five. Number five, uh, we already talked about seaweed, so I kind of gave that one away. The other thing that I would choose is spaghetti squash. Oh, yummy. Mm. <laughs> when, when, when individuals are looking, I work with a lot of people who have um, diabetes or um, pre-diabetes or obesity related to insulin resistance, uh, especially when that obesity is really concentrated right in the belly. That's a, a dead, dead ringer for insulin-mediated body fat. And we're trying to reduce the carbohydrate density of their body. That doesn't mean we're trying to eliminate carbohydrates, but it means we're trying to trade out sugars and sweeteners and foods made with flour, like pasta, for more vegetables, more beans, more nuts and seeds, and more fruit. And a wonderful alternative to pasta is spaghetti squash. Most people have seen spaghetti squash in the store. It's the very large melon-looking uh, yellow squash that you can oh, split down the middle. Uh, on the inside, it looks a bit like a pumpkin, and you scoop out the seeds in the pulp, and you can roast it um, flesh side down. Uh, for uh, typically on about 350 degrees for about uh, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, it will steam in its own juice. And when you flip it back over, um, when you take it out of the oven, it will be quite moist. And if you take a fork, you can actually drag it across the surface of the spaghetti squash and make these little tendrils of squash that look and have a very similar texture to pasta. And it's a great way to still enjoy all of your favorite nutrient-rich sauces, like a, a, a really lovely red sauce with onions and garlic and oregano and tomatoes. It's so good for us. But putting that on top of a vegetable, but still enjoying the visceral experience of a pasta-like food. Um, it tends to cut the calories in a pasta dish by about, wait for it, 60%. Huge wow. reduction in calories that still allows people who are trying to lose weight an opportunity to really savor a pasta-like meal, but with a delicious vegetable alternative. Oh I think my. those are pretty interesting uh, foods for people to try that haven't tried them before. Mm. I want to get to our last uh, category, and this one, I think, maybe just for the purpose of time, I'm going to have you list them, and if we want to talk about some of them afterwards, we can do that. Uh, your five healthiest herbs or spices. This was a really hard one because I think uh, most people would be shocked to find out just how um, not just nutritious, but healing pretty much all herbs and spices are. Um, really, really potent ingredients that have been used for millennia, uh, not just in seasoning food, but in herbal tinctures that have been used for a huge array of um, illness treatment. But on my list, I chose garlic, ginger, turmeric, oregano, and cilantro. Probably no surprises for you there. And I, and I have to confess, when we in the pre-show, when we were chatting about spices and Christina excitedly brought up cinnamon, I <laughs> immediately had a, a shock reaction that I had forgotten cinnamon because I'd probably add that to my list as well. But truth be told, there are many that I would add. But, uh, but I think those would be my top five, Glenn. I could eliminate the cilantro, but I know a lot of people really mm. like that. And I would certainly Love choose it. cinnamon over cilantro. Uh, but the others were uh, oregano I didn't think of. I think I had um, maybe a nutmeg or, uh, again, for my top 36 spices. <laughs> 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 no, I think those were good. Christina, any quick thoughts on your? Oh, I, well, I think we mentioned before the, sh uh, before the show cinnamon and clove, how important mm -hmm. clove was as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you see, they're all, I, when you look at this, it's... Um, these spices are very Asian, Asian, Indian, you know, I mean, all uh -huh. of Asia. 
because sure. of the turmeric and the oregano and the cilantro and um, uh, the turmeric, the turmeric, let me think. There's another Indian spice that's very powerful. Cumin. Cumin. Cumin mm-hmm. and cardamom. Yes. Mm-hmm. Number of those. Yeah. And they it's use a-, a lot of cinnamon in their cooking as well. Yes, they do. They use cinnamon in a um, a savory way, not just a sweet way. Yes. Uh, in fact, I, I recommend cinnamon mm-hmm. very often when people are just trying to cut down on sweets because uh, given Western use of cinnamon, mm-hmm. pretty much anything you put cinnamon on feels like a sweet to people. Right. We were chatting earlier about a sweet potato or um, a winter squash, like a, um, a butternut or an acorn squash. If you will put just a little bit of cinnamon on that when you prepare it, it has a way of just satisfying our need for something a little sweet. Even though there's no added sugar there, we perceive it as being sweet or as a treat because that's what we're we're used to. That's what we train mm-hmm. our, our bodies to expect, that cinnamon means a treat. It means sweetness. Mm. That's true, isn't it? Mm. Wow. I love yep. the I love each list. I eat <laughs> we had each a, list. We had a few more. We were going to talk about the most dangerous foods, and we were also going to talk about um, what food you would have for your last supper. But I think uh, mm. since we're speaking with Tracy Harrison, our health uh, counselor uh, who focuses on food and nutrition and eating with purpose, It's time again, Tracy, as you know more than anyone now, for our health tip. I love health tips. Uh, I'm going to share one of my favorite ones today, actually. And this goes out to um, all of the women out there who struggle with perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms, which is a huge portion of our population. Um, Women can struggle with all sorts of different symptoms as a result of not just low, but more importantly, fluctuating hormone levels. And there are a a tremendous number of documented risks with um, using, in particular, estrogen therapy um, Mm -hmm. for women who still have their ovaries. Um, But um, what a lot of people don't realize is that there are weak estrogens, weak estrogenic properties in a whole host of different foods. And I have used ground flaxseed, believe it or not, ground flaxseed to help a huge number of my um, uh, female clients in this age range to get relief naturally from things like hot flashes or uh, dry mouth, dry skin, um, or uh, vaginal dryness. Um, these are the kinds of symptoms that can plague a lot of women, not just in or postmenopausally, but in the throes of menopause or during the perimenopausal years. You only need about two tablespoons of ground flaxseed each day. Um, and, and what happens is that the the weekly estrogenic um, molecules within flax fit into uh, estrogen receptors in the body and actually block the ability of the stronger estrogens from triggering cellular action. Mm. Um, There's all sorts of clinical research pointing to the benefits um, of flaxseed um, for um, helping to prevent um, breast cancer and also being used as a um, complementary therapy. Uh, and of course, as we talked about earlier, it's a wonderfully mineral dense food. It's an awesome source of plant based omega three uh, fats, uh, and also a source of protein. So there are a lot of different reasons to choose it. You don't have to cook it. Uh, you do have to eat it ground to get the hormonal benefits I mentioned. It cannot be whole. Um, you also have to eat it ground to get the omega three benefits. Mm. Um, so when you grind it, uh, you can buy it ground or you can grind your own in a in a coffee grinder or spice grinder. You do want to keep it in the refrigerator um, to prevent uh, spoilage, but you can sprinkle it on top of almost any food, um, in yogurt, on top of a soup, added to a smoothie, um, sprinkled on top of even even scrambled eggs for breakfast. Mm. Um, But a nice, simple way to get some hormone relief that doesn't involve medications or um, stronger, potentially riskier hormone therapies. Now, would it make a difference, uh, Tracy, if it was cooked or not? Because I, I know a lot of us use it in our baking. Right. So for the benefits that I'm talking about it, we need it to be not cooked. We need okay. it to be raw. 
Okay. And and just for the record, by the way, you don't really want to cook omega threes at a very high temperature. Um, they're very uh, vulnerable to oxidation. So I think if you're using it um, at a low temperature, it's fine. Um, and at a high temperature, um, as long as the seeds are whole, it's not going to matter very much. Uh, it's a good source of roughage in the mm-hmm. diet. Um, but the omega-3s are really locked inside. But I don't recommend heating to any high temperatures things that have um, a lot of omega-3s in them because it, it will oxidize the fats pretty readily. Mm. Like cooking wild salmon? <laughs> well, so oh. to your point, the difference here is that when the flaxseed is ground, we expose the fats they're not locked up in the fiber matrix in the food Mm. anymore. Just like in the salmon, the omega-3s are actually clustered at the interface between the flesh and the skin. So um, it's another good reason why um, you should buy salmon. um, When you buy uh, salmon with the skin, leave the skin on. If you don't want the skin, take it off after the cooking, not before. Mm. Um, You will retain uh, the freshness of the uh, omega-3s much more readily that way. Mm, interesting. Wow. So it's it's an issue. Um, the, the oxidation of oils or fats becomes an issue when we start to separate them from their native food. When we so, leave them intact, um, it's, it's part of how nature naturally protects it. So in the absence of burning it, um, mm-hmm. we really can can cook it um, Ooh, fairly wonderful safely. Tip. Wonderful um, tip. So that's a, it's a great question. Because, because I know a lot of people are using the ground flax as an egg substitute now. They mm. soak it in water and it becomes an egg substitute for baking. Mm-hmm. So so that would be something to keep uh, people so informed I think of. <laughs> low, low temperature baking, again, I don't think is really an issue, um, like around maybe 300, 325 mm-hmm. degrees. Um, but, um, but, I, but generally speaking, we're really going to get the best benefit from omega-3s um, from flaxseed when we're consuming it in a raw ground form. It's not that it's going to hurt us to eat oxidized fats. That's why we have antioxidants um, pathways in our (laughs) body, right? We eat plenty of oxidized foods. Mm -hmm. But in the sense of just making the choice about the predominant way that you consume it, especially if you're going to be kind of supplementing via your food Mm -hmm. in that way. Just something to keep in mind. Oh, wonderful. Tracy, that was a great uh, health tip as always. But I would like to add that uh, although you uh, suggested that this is a lot for the women, all of the men should listen to this because we are with our women that are going through things like this or will go through uh, menopause at some point. So it's good for us to know about this also to take care of our women very nicely. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Thanks for that, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful to our very special guest, Tracy Harrison, for sharing her wisdom and expertise with us. I would also like to thank all of my healers and teachers for allowing me to be on my journey. And thank you, Christine, and all of Yoga Hub for our magical medical tour. Look forward to getting together again with all of you next week as we search another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. And until that time, thank you so much, Tracy and Christina, and I wish you all optimal health. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Christina. Another fun show. Another fun show. Yes, you're infectious, Tracy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Woolman. Um, and of course, to each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, followed every other week with Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. I'd like to remind you that you can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman by following him on Twitter, at Glenn Woolman, and of course through his own website, glennwoolman.com, where I do encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath. And I'd like to also add, if you would like to contact Tracy Harrison, uh, please go to wildlysuccessfulhc.com. Again, we're always grateful for your feedback. Please give us a call, leave us a message or some suggestions at 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK. Until next time, namaste.
YHTV's Trinity of Life. Come join me, Christina Suzama, as I journey to find the many modalities that support individuals, from children to adults to elders, with topics ranging from health and wellness, meditation, and inspirational stories. I invite you to visit yogahub.tv every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. I don't know, as a, as a parent, which one would throw me off balance more uh, to find out my son was the bullier or my son was being bullied. Do, do, do you know my, it's almost like, wow. I mean, they're both awful, yeah. but which yeah. one would really affect me even more? And, and I do yeah. believe Sandy, because of who I am, it would really shock me if I found out my son was the bullier. Yeah. It would shock me and it would be, I would be like, 